Well, we've made it to Malachi, which is the last book in the Minor Prophets. So we're getting near the end of our series on the Minor Prophets. Uh, this is the first message I plan to share with you from Malachi. There will probably be three, maybe four. It's a short book, just four chapters, and the chapters are not long. Uh, but there's a lot in Malachi that is uh, very relevant to our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak to us by your Holy Spirit through the book of Malachi. Please apply the truths in Malachi to the hearts and minds of each person who reads Malachi and each person who listens to uh, this message. Um, encourage us, strengthen us, guide us, correct us where we need to be corrected, warn us, um, equip us, through your word we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's jump into the wonderful book of Malachi. Verse 1, a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. So we don't know much about who Malachi was, other than that he was a prophet who lived in Judah in about 450 B.C., about 450 years before Jesus was born. So he is ministering, Malachi is ministering, about 100 years after the people were allowed to return from exile, from the Babylonian exile, and perhaps 80 years or so after Haggai and Zechariah encouraged the people to rebuild the temple. Now, if you're reading uh, a book, especially, the, well, the Old Testament or the New Testament, and you want this type of background information, one of the places you can find it is in study Bibles. I just, I, I like to share some of my sources so that you can do your own study if you want to. And um, in this case, uh, this information came from the ESV uh, study Bible, which the, the introductions to the Bible books from the ESV Study Bible are available online for free, even if you don't have an ESV Study Bible, or at least many of them are. I think probably all of them. Um, all of the notes are not available, but the, the book introductions are. Anyways, this helps us understand what's going on and, 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 and when this prophecy came. So the temple has been rebuilt. Babylon had destroyed it when they invaded Judah. The people were allowed to return, and the temple has been rebuilt. The people who were alive during the time of Malachi, um, it was probably mostly their grandparents, in some cases maybe their great-grandparents, who had done the work to rebuild the, the temple. And the worship of God has been restored. They're offering the sacrifices uh, prescribed by Moses. Uh, they have the altar. And, um, but, but the people may have been disappointed as the Messiah had not yet appeared and Judah had been reduced to a small area. The, 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 what, what is called Judah at this time is smaller than it was earlier in the Old Testament. And it's just a small part of what Israel used to be. And they are still under the rule of a pagan king. They're allowed to have their own governor. They're allowed to worship God at the temple in their own way. That's, that's good. But uh, they don't, they're not an independent nation. And, um, and, and, and the, over, over their governor, there is a, a pagan king ruling from, from Persia. Now, to us, we know how the story goes. And we know that uh, 450 years later, Jesus comes and... Uh, he, he, he dies for our sins, and he rises from the dead, and then he promises that he's going to come back. And we get a lot more revel <coughs> excuse me, a lot more revelation and information in the New Testament. But these people didn't have all that. They had promises that a Messiah was going to come, that Israel was going to be restored to glory, that God was going to do great things for them. But... They weren't seeing what they expected to see. Um, they, they, they were not seeing it. Their parents didn't see it. Their grandparents didn't see it. So it's easy to imagine how they could be kind of discouraged 
as they are following and worshiping God. Now, the people have not fallen back into widespread idol worship. Um, now, there are some indications that there were some Israelites that had gone in that direction, but it doesn't seem like it's widespread the way it was in uh, Israel, the northern kingdom, and at times in Judah before the uh, exiles. Um, but neither are their hearts and lives fully devoted to God. They're kind of, well, we might call them lukewarm today. They're, they're not really all in. Uh, and, and, and so God speaks through Malachi to call them to trust and honor him as they should. And I think we can relate to the people of God who lived in Malachi's day. For instance, one poll after another shows that in some ways the church in the U.S. is in decline. Uh, uh, less and less people identify as Christians. There's a whole movement called evangelicals of people who have left the evangelical Christian faith. And, and, and at the same time, that things like church uh, attendance and people identifying with Christianity is declining, immorality and deception seems to be growing. I'm talking about what's happening in my own nation in the United States. Around the world, praise God, Christianity continues to spread and, and grow overall. But um, here in my nation, it seems like immorality and deception, things go from bad to worse. And it's easy to become disheartened and for this to be reflected in how we serve God. It's not that we should be happy about the situation, but the situation shouldn't keep us from doing our part, from being totally faithful, from being all in, from trusting God, believing his promises, just as much as people do when they're in the midst of revival. Uh, in theory, it should be like that, but in practice, it's easy for us to become discouraged and for, for that discouragement to be reflected in our service to God in the way that we follow God. Now, uh, it's been announced that there's going to be a prophecy uh, from God through Malachi. Let's see what the first things, uh, the first thing God tells them and tells us through Malachi is. Let's see what God says first. I love this. Uh, I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you, says the Lord. What a great way for a message from God to begin. H how incredibly encouraging. Now, if you can hold on to this truth, this truth that God loves you, it will change how you feel as you go through life and deal with difficulties. It will change how you think about lots of things, about just about everything. It will change how you talk to other people. You will become a source of encouragement and light and hope. It will change your priorities in life. It will change your whole life. Knowing and believing that God loves you is, 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 is one of the most important things about a person. If, if we know this, if we can hold on to it, it's one of the most important truths in the whole world. I think one of the best songs in the whole world is a children's song, namely, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Jesus, I'm, I'm not a great singer, but I just, I see those words and I want to, uh, in my own humble way, just, 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 just remind us of them. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Boy, if the Bible says it, we can believe it. Little ones to him belong. Compared to God, we're all little ones. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will help people to believe this. It's, e it's, it's relatively easy to believe when things are going good. Sometimes it's hard to hold on to this truth when we're being battered by the storms of life and when we're suffering and when we're facing opposition and, and, and when we're struggling or, or, or if we've stumbled. But you love us in all those situations. Your love doesn't depend on those things. Your love is like a rock that never moves. It's steady. Nothing in all creation 
uh, can separate us from your love, angels or demons or uh, and not even death. Nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you, Lord. So he begins by reminding us and the people back in Malachi's day that God loves them. But sometimes we doubt. And the people in Malachi's day apparently did doubt this because in the next part of the verse, they respond this way. They say, uh, but you ask, the people ask, how have you loved us? Um, so kind of paraphrasing this into day-to-day -day language today, it would be kind of like them saying, I I I'm not feeling it, God. And it's probably because of the situation they were in. Um, the pagan empires had not been defeated. The Messiah had not appeared. Israel had not been restored to greatness. Their day-to-day their -day lives were often difficult. And uh, so they're saying, hey, ha ha how have you loved us? Uh, and so, so as we said in the introduction, the people may have been discouraged and disappointed with their circumstances. Have you ever felt like that? Um, there, there, there are things in your life that are not the way you want them to be, and maybe there have been things in your life that aren't the way you want them to be, and it's been like that for a long time. And that's the situation they were in, and sometimes we are in the same situation. And there's a part of our brain that knows that God loves us if we believe the Bible, but maybe you're not feeling it as deeply as you should, this reality that God loves you. Now, God is going to point out in Malachi, he's going to point out one of the many ways in which he showed his love to Israel, to, to, to those people who had returned from exile. We will need to think about what is the equivalent for us. So let's look at how God answers them here in Malachi. It says, uh, God says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, uh, declares the Lord. So he's talking about two brothers, but as we'll see in a minute, he's also talking about the two nations that came from the two brothers. The Esau and Jacob, we, we, we read about them in the book of Genesis. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now, there is a sense in which this applies to the two brothers. Um, and God hating them doesn't mean that... Um, uh, I, I think basically what it means is that there's one that he shows for a special purpose and not the other one. Um, yet I have loved J Jacob, but Esau I, I have hated. And now... I think he's mainly talking about the two nations that come from Jacob and Esau. In um, English, we normally don't call a nation by the name of the person who started it, but in the Bible days, they often did. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, Though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. So, let's try to understand God's answer. Um, first, we'll try to understand it here in Malachi. What did the, what, how was he answering the people's question about how does he love them? Uh, in Malachi for the people who lived back then. Uh, and then we'll think about how it might apply to us. What would be a similar type of answer today? Um, and I've already mentioned that where it talks about Esau and Jacob, um, uh, they were brothers, but when it talks about he's, he's hating one and loving the other, it's mainly talking about the nations that descended from them. Also, you need to know that Esau and Edom are two names for the same ethnic group, two names for the same uh, people group, the same nation. Uh, Edom was an, a wicked nation under God's wrath. Now, that doesn't mean that there, were, um, there was not a single individual in all of Edom who knew the true God and followed him. We don't know that. 
but in general, they were a wicked nation under God's wrath. Whereas Jacob is um, also what we call Israel, the Israelites. They are the people of Israel. By the way, Jacob's name in Genesis uh, is changed to Israel. Um, uh, so, so Jacob is the people of Israel whom God has chosen as his own people. So God was basically telling the people of Israel that he loved them by choosing them to be his own people, which is far better than the fate of others. He's saying, look, if I didn't choose you to be mine, if I wasn't um, redeeming you and transforming you and being patient with you and helping you to become more godly and forgiving you for your sins, if I hadn't given you knowledge to know how to seek me so that you could be with me and be my people, you could be like Edom you, you, you would be wicked in the past. They were wicked, and there's still sin in their lives. He says, I could be treating you like them, uh, just constantly under my wrath, uh, headed towards destruction. Um, so the fact that, I, that God has chosen them to be his people is, is a huge way that he has shown his love for them. So they say, have you loved us? And he says, you're mine. I, I, I showed you to be mine, and as a result, you are not a nation that is heading towards destruction. Um, now, how might this apply to us today? Well, like the people of Israel, which is which we'll call Jacob, um, because of his great love for us, God has chosen us Christians to be his people. Now, it was, a, it was an honor to be named after Jacob because Jacob was a man of faith in, in the Old Testament, and he was... Uh, the father of the uh, 12 men who became the leaders and um, the source of the 12 tribes of Israel. But what a much, much greater honor it is to be called Christian. Uh, we are named after Jesus Christ. Of course, Christ means the Messiah. And, and, and to be called Christians is a great honor. And um, just like uh, the people of Israel have been chosen to be God's people. We have been chosen to be God's people in an even bigger, deeper way. Let's jump into the New Testament and see an example of this in 1 John chapter 3. <coughs> see what great love the Father has lavished on us. So, just like in Malachi, he's reminding us that he loves us. God is reminding us of this truth. We know it in our brains if we believe the Bible, uh, but sometimes uh, we doubt. Sometimes even if we would um, uh, answer a question correctly on an exam, does God love you, true or false, we would mark true. Sometimes we don't feel it in all the areas of our life. So it's reminding us of this truth so that it can walk into all the areas of his life. And even in, especially in the tough parts of our life, we can know that God loves us. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. So once again, uh, one of the ways, it, it, one of the greatest ways that he shows his love for us is that he's called us to himself. And of course, we know that in order for us to become children of God, that Jesus died for our sins, uh, the greatest love, act of love in history. So we are called his children, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. If you are a Christian, if you have been saved, if, if you have believed in Jesus, you've been born again, and then hopefully you uh, obeyed God's command to be baptized as a, as a testimony and as an outward sign and symbol of what he has done for you on the inside. Uh, if you are a child of God, um, you are right now, even though you're still messed up, even though you still live in this crazy world, um, you are part of the family of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. So we have a glorious future. God has told us some parts of that, but he hasn't told us everything. And even the parts that he has told us, we can only imagine a little bit. He goes on to say, but we know, so there are some things we do know about our future, but we know that when Christ appears, when he comes back the second time, 
we shall be like him. Hallelujah. For we shall see him as he is. So we are going to be like Jesus. We, uh, m- most people will have died before Jesus comes back. If, if any of us happen to be alive when he comes back, we'll be transformed instantly to become like him. Uh, everyone else will be resurrected and we will be immoral like he is immoral we will be incorruptible like he is incorruptible we will also be holy like he is holy now i can believe that is true in my brain but it's hard for me to know how wonderful it's going to feel to never sin again to never have a desire to sin again oh god how i look forward to that day And then all of the things that have come into the world as a result of sin will also be gone. There'll be no more sickness. (coughs) I have a little uh, uh, allergy symptoms. Uh, And and that's a pretty minor sickness compared to what some people are going through, uh, cancer and other serious diseases. Uh, But none of that, not even the mild, not even allergies, all of that will be gone. Hallelujah. And then there'll probably be other things that we can't even imagine. Um... We will be like him. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So we're not going to be 100% holy and pure in our conduct, in our actions, in our thinking, in how we speak until Jesus comes back. But we want to, we we know this is our destiny and, and we're driven to move in that direction now in this life to purify ourselves. That means we have to be involved in the process. There's work for us to do. We could never do it without God's help, but, but he does call us to purify ourselves, to get the sin out of our lives. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Now, uh, here's a question. Is being chosen by God to be a Christian, to be part of his eternal family, really equivalent to God choosing the nation of Israel, also called Jacob? And the answer is uh, yes, uh, Paul thought so. Um, So Paul, talking about God choosing us to be part of his his people, choosing us to be saved, choosing us to have eternal life, um, he quotes from this very passage in Malachi, Romans 9, 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And you can go and read the context. Uh, Well, read the whole book of Romans if you want a lot of wonderful, glorious context. But he's clearly talking about the fact that God has chosen us those who are Christians, those who are saved, and is similar to what God did when he shows Jacob. And um, and, and so, yes, this is a right way to apply it to our lives, is to think of us being chosen to be part of God's family. So God starts out in Malachi by reminding us that he loves us. This is a mighty foundation. Uh, He loves us, and he has chosen us to be his people. He then moves on to show how we should respond. This response is not the reason he loves us. Remember, he loves us while we are still sinners. But it is how we should treat God in response to his great love. So God is not saying, this is what you need to do so that I will love you. Nope, that's the wrong way to think about it. Instead, God is saying, I have loved you now in light of this mighty, wonderful good news this is how you should be living, and you're not totally living this way. And the people back in Malachi's day, a lot of them were not doing a very good job at this, and a lot of us are not doing a very good job at it today. God wants us to honor him by giving him our very best. This is what we're going to see. This is what God is going to tell them. (coughs) He wants us to treat him as a great king because he is a great king. He wants the whole world to honor him in this way. Let's read and see how God says this in Malachi. Okay, so we're continuing in Malachi, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, that should be the case, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? This is God speaking. If I am a master... Where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you priests who show contempt for my name. So even the leaders of the people were not honoring God the way he should. Now, 
when you read that, you might think, huh, who does that apply to today? Uh, well, the job of a pastor is a little bit like the job of a priest. And that's true. It applies to, to pastors. But in the New Testament, um, we have this new uh, truth. Uh, some people call it the priesthood of the believer. All Christians are like priests. We all have access to God. We can all intercede on behalf of others for God. And so really this applies to all of us today, continuing in uh, the end of verse 6. So, so, so God says, you're not honoring me. But then the people ask, but you ask, uh, how have we shown contempt for your name? And then in verse 7, God answers, by offering defiled food on my altar. So back in those days, part of the way they worshiped God was by bringing sacrifices. And these sacrifices were normally some type of food. Uh, the most common type being animal sacrifices. By offering defiled food on my altar, but you ask, the people ask, how have we defiled you? And God answers by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we don't bring animal sacrifices uh, to, to church these days. That's, that's no longer part of the way that God has for us to worship him. Um, so how does this apply to our lives? Well, I don't think it's too hard to see how it applies to our lives. The, the, the point is that God wants us to give him our very best of everything, our very best, because this shows that we love and honor him. Okay, continuing in verse 9, we'll talk about this some more as we go. Now, now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. So the people were supposed to bring um, good quality sacrifices to God, but they were not doing that. They were, instead of bringing like the, 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 the good quality animals, they were bringing poor quality animals. Now, this showed the condition of their heart, that they really didn't value God the way they should have. They didn't r really understand and believe how, how wonderful it was that God had chosen them and how much God loved them. Um, and, and this was shown in how they were acting. And so God says, if that's how you feel about me, then uh, th th these, sacri these animal sacrifices really aren't worth anything. Just don't even bother. Don't even come to the temple and, and, and don't think that they're going to help you, that I'm going to say, oh, they're doing these animal sacrifices, so now I'm going to bless them. God is like, no, uh, those sacrifices prove that you don't really love me. You don't really believe I'm great. You don't really honor me, at least to some extent. Uh, it, it, it's reflected in the sacrifices. Now let's continue in verse 11. God says, my name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, God wants people everywhere to know how great he is. And when people know how great he is, this should be this reflected in the way we serve him, in the way we worship him. And we'll talk about what types of offerings we give to God now in a few minutes. But he wants people not just in Judah, not just in Israel, but he wants people all around the world to know about his love, power, wisdom, and grace. When people know about these things, it changes their lives. Of course, today they also find out that God loves us by sending Jesus to die for our sins and that Jesus rose again and that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And when they believe that, they're saved and born again and they get the gift of eternal life and our sins are forgiven. Um, and then also as we go through life, remembering and knowing these truths about God gives us ho hope, gives us st inner strength, gives us encouragement, gives us guidance, helps us to live meaningful lives. 
So God wants everyone to know about him because it's the most important thing in the world to know about is God and how good he is and how great he is and how wise he is so that we will trust him and follow him and live for him. This ideal is not just in Malachi, it's <coughs> really all throughout the Bible, but we saw it in Habakkuk, for instance, um, where it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God wants everyone everywhere <coughs> to know how great he is. And God is basically saying to the people in Malachi's day, how are other people going to see how great I am, people who don't even know about me yet, if you do know about me and you're not treating me like a great God? You're kind of half-heartedly, uh, you know, worshiping me. You're, you're, you're not all in. You're not giving me your best. How can you expect other people to, to, to do that? So this ideal about God wanting uh, the knowledge of how good and wonderful he is to spread all over the world um, this is happening today. It is spreading all over the world. This is being accomplished through the advance of the Great Commission all around the world. Praise God today in every political nation on earth, like all of the nations that are recognized by the United Nations, for example, there are at least some Christians. Um, it may be a very small number. They may be mostly kind of like underground, but there are some Christians in every nation, and in many nations, there are many Christians, but there are still people groups and languages where there is very little or, in some cases, perhaps no gospel witness. So there's still work to do, but praise God, uh, uh, God's plan for, for people all around the world to learn about him is being accomplished. Okay, continuing back in Malachi chapter 1, in verse 12, God wants his name to be great, but he says, but you profane it by saying the Lord's table is defiled and his food is contemptible. And you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord, so that people feel like God's asking too much of them. And God's saying, no, <laughs> I'm a great God. You should be giving me your best. Uh, it's not too much for me to ask your best from you. And then in verse 14, God says, Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. So if someone doesn't have any good quality animals, then that's a different issue. But here he's saying the people have good quality animals. They know they're supposed to give those to me. And they're not doing it. He says, for I'm a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Now, how does this apply to us? Well, God also wants us today <coughs> to honor him by the way we live. He wants our very best. In fact, he wants all of us. Let's, let's look at this in some New Testament verses. <coughs> Romans 12.1. Um, therefore, I urge you, excuse me, <coughs> I have this little cough, uh, like I said, triggered by my allergies. Um, it doesn't bother me that much. I hope and pray it doesn't distract you that much. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, here, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is speaking to God's family, those of us who have been loved and, 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 and we're called children of God, and that means that we are brothers and sisters to each other, and we should treat each other as brothers and sisters who love one another. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So this is not saying in order to get God's mercy, you have to do all this stuff and live a great life. No, it's saying God has already shown you mercy. While you were messed up, in the midst of your sins, you had no hope. You couldn't save yourself. God has shown you mercy. Now, how should you live? And he says, you should offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So we don't offer uh, 
animal sacrifices, but um, we offer ourselves to God, and, and, and we don't, of course, physically get up on an altar and somebody kills us. Uh, we, we, we don't do that. But we live our whole life for God. We are a living sacrifice. We aren't living for ourselves. We are living for Jesus. We should be. That's our goal. <coughs> living for Jesus. Our bodies are the living sacrifice. That means everything we do with our bodies, and that includes our brains, uh, everywhere our feet go, everywhere, everything our hands do, everything our mouths say, everything our eyes look at, um, uh, all of the thoughts that our brains have, we should seek for these things to be lined up with God's will and to be willing to do his, his will even when it's costly for us. That's why it's called a sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. So just like God doesn't want blemished animals back in Malachi, he wants us to have pure and holy lives uh, living for him. Now, I know we're not going to be 100% sinless in this life, but we should be striving for holiness. We should be striving to live lives that are pleasing to God with his help, <coughs> knowing that his mercies are new every mor morning and he has grace for us, but we still want to live uh, holy and pleasing lives. This is your true and proper worship. So this is how we are called to worship God today. And um, we see some similar ideals in other places in the Bible. <coughs> in Philippians, Paul wrote, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, he's not saying you need to conduct yourselves so that you can be forgiven of your sins. You need to have good conduct to be forgiven of your sins. No, that's totally not how it works. The whole reason we need to be forgiven is because our conduct isn't good enough. But he's saying, since you have been forgiven, you should live in a way that reflects this truth. Uh, and for example, in Philippians, we learned, uh, and I have a whole sermon series on Philippians. In Philippians, we learned that living a life worthy of the gospel includes humbly serving others, humbly serving other people, uh, acting as if their needs are more important than our own in, in terms of how we treat them. And we see a similar ideal of being called to live uh, worthy of what God has done for us in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, this is the beginning of the second half. Uh, the first half is full of the uh, glorious good news and the basic gospel. Um, and then in, in, in chapter 4, he starts to talk about well, since all that is true, since we've been saved, since we've been forgiven, <coughs> since we've become part of God's people, how should we live? And he writes, as a prisoner for the Lord, he was actually in prison, uh, suffering for the gospel when he wrote this, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He doesn't say live a life so that you will receive this calling. He's saying you've already been called to be part of part of God's family. Now live up to that. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, you can go read Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. <coughs> that that's, wouldn't take you very long, probably like 10 minutes. Um, although if you stopped and thought about it all, well, that might be the rest of your life. Um, but just, just uh, to remind us a little bit of what is in those chapters, in Ephesians we learn that living a life worthy of the calling we have received includes humbly walking in unity with other Christians. It includes getting rid of sin in our lives. It includes doing our part to have healthy families. Now, you don't get to choose what family you were born into, and there may be things that you can't change. Don't worry about that. But do what you can. Do your part to have healthy families. Um, putting on the armor of God in order to fight the spiritual battles we are called to fight. These are some of the ways that we live a life worthy of the calling we have received. So, in summary, <coughs> what we have learned from Malachi chapter 1, God loves us. One of the most important truths in the whole world. He loves you. He has shown us his love by calling us to be his own people. 
And if you are not God, part of God's people, he wants you to be. And you can become part of God's people by trusting in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Um, and if you do that, I hope that you will get connected with uh, a mature, godly Christian or, uh, you know, go to a church, talk to a pastor or someone else you know, tell them about it, pray with them, and, 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 and then um, and, and be baptized and start following Jesus. God loves us, and God loves us while we are still sinners. Uh, how much more he loves us um, when we become his children, and God wants us to honor him. Uh, because of how great he is and how good he is, and because he is the great king, he wants us to honor him. We do this by seeking to present our lives to him as worthy and holy sacrifices. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you that you love us. You have loved us. Help us to love you back and to express our love to you in ways that we should honoring you. Help us to live holy lives. Help us to follow Jesus. Help us to serve you. Help us to give you our very best and, and not to give in to discouragement and disappointment, but to trust you, to believe your promises. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.